the pandemic, you know, like we know, has changed our approach to day-to-day -day life, okay? We've reinvented ourselves and we've done things we never imagined ourselves doing without really losing the sync with our roots. Our next keynote segment is going to be about inspiring us as an industry to look forward to the great opportunities and possibilities that lie in the future. It's also about opening our minds to all of this. I would now like to invite our keynote speaker, the CEO of Imagine Marketing, parent company of Boat Lifestyle, former CEO and managing director of Godrej Consumer Product Limited, and was also the founding member of Bain & Company's consulting operations in India. He's also an advisor to the Kailash Satyarthi Children's Foundation and Central Square Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with a huge round of applause, Vivek Gambhir on stage. Thank you very much, uh, Pooja. It's, uh, it's a pleasure being here. And uh, a big thank you to Manish. I think Manish is a a legend in the industry and the way he set things up and the way he's run MRSI has been fantastic from what I've heard. And again, I've been working with Mithali and the MRSI team and uh, I can certainly vouch for uh, the high quality team that is leading this association. And a uh, you know, big shout out to my ex-colleague Soreen, who I worked a lot for many years at uh, Goatridge and Soreen invited me here. And when Soreen called me, I said, you know, Soreen, whatever you ask, I can't say no. Uh, and so, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, Pooja laid out a very tall agenda. I'm not even sure if I'll be able to do any justice uh, to the expectations, but hopefully, uh, you can doze off now. You know, evening is when you have all the energy, so it's okay. Uh, but what I'll try and do is just share a little bit of my, uh, my observations about the industry. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about the past and a little bit of a reflection in terms of the future that's, uh, that's going ahead. Um, I, I chose this picture uh, for a certain reason. Can anyone guess what uh, on your, uh, the right side is? Yeah, some of you said it. It's the Rosetta Stone, right? And uh, for those of you who know the history of the Rosetta Stone, um, there is a small town in Egypt called uh, Rashid which uh, the French couldn't pronounce. And Rashid became uh, Rosetta. And Rashid actually means a guide, of being guided by. And uh, the Rosetta Stone was an amazing discovery. I think discovered probably by Napoleon and his army in 1799. Till then, the entire Egyptian civilization was quite a bit of a mystery. And this uh, stone, it's a graphite stone, uh, now housed in uh, London. Uh, it has three different languages in it. There's a language of hieroglyphs, uh, which is the language that the priests used. There's a language of uh, demotics, which the common people used. And then the third part was the language that the ancient Greeks used. And so using the ancient Greek language, uh, a lot of scholars then discovered the entire world of hieroglyphs. And hieroglyphs in, in many ways provided an amazing window into the knowledge, into the art and the history and culture of an incredibly rich Egyptian civilization. So in many ways, what all of you are doing are being the Rosetta Stones uh, in the world today, to being able to uncover, unpack, and really help uh, companies and organizations really make sense of a lot of insights. And so I think a big congratulations to all of you for the incredible work you are doing. Please give yourselves a very big hand, actually, you know. I think today and tomorrow should also be a moment of celebration of the incredible work that you are doing. And Manish talked about the, the history uh, of the organization, and he went back to 1988. But the industry as a whole actually has even a much more richer history. And for many people, I think, the formal industry began a little over 100 years uh, ago. Uh, any guesses in terms of who the 
founder of uh, modern research is, is considered? Any guesses? Okay. There's a guy who everyone claims called Daniel Starch in the 1920s where the formal industry started and Daniel uh, used to actually walk around uh, taking, uh, asking people about which ads they had seen in newspapers. And then he'd compare that to the amount of newspapers being sold to be able to get an effectiveness of advertising. Post Daniel Starch, uh, obviously, uh, George Gallup was the one who pioneered the entire idea of aided recall. But what a lot of people don't know is that while Daniel Starch is credited being the father of modern research, the person who probably uh, started market research in a formal way uh, was a guy by the name of uh, Charles Coolidge uh, Parlin. So Charles used to work for a company called the Curtis Publishing Company in the early 1900s. And uh, he used to be a teacher. And uh, the Curtis Publishing Company hired him and uh, without a title. And so he gave himself the title of being a commercial researcher. And then commercial research became market research. And uh, Curtis Publishing Company at that time had bought a, um, a magazine called The Country Gentleman, which would sell products to agriculturalists. And this company did not know very much about the agriculture industry. So uh, Curtis actually went and spent a lot of time uh, talking to farmers, understanding the agricultural industry, and came back with a 460-page report, which I think probably was the first official market research report that people can talk about. The point of mentioning this again is that all of you should feel very proud that you are part of an incredibly rich industry. And I always find uh, history to be very important. It's so important to know where you have come from. As Manish said, what got you here will not get you there in the future. But it's so important to remind yourself of the roots uh, because it gives you a sense of anchoring and a sense of grounding. Uh, and I think it's, you should all feel very, very proud that you belong to an industry that over the last century and longer than that has provided so much incredible value uh, to businesses and organizations uh, alike. But as we all know, we are all facing a huge amount of change. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, consumer preferences are changing. Uh, there are a huge amount of advances happening in technology. Uh, the geopolitical environment, the role of China uh, is changing quite a bit. Uh, Manish talked about the importance of sustainability being one of the core pillars uh, of what a lot of you are doing. Business boundaries are changing. There is still a huge amount of capital available in the industry. And you are seeing a lot of activist investors who are trying to play a much stronger voice in the way you know, companies can run. And what is quite interesting is that in spite of all this change, which can feel a bit uncomfortable, there are some tremendous opportunities that will get created. And I'd encourage you to spend the next couple of you know, days really thinking about the kind of opportunities this kind of change will put in front of you. And just as an example, take a look at the kind of business models that have been emerging. The world's largest taxi company today owns no vehicles. The world's most popular media owner actually creates no content. The world's most valuable retailer keeps pretty much no inventory at all. The world's largest accommodation provider owns almost no real estate. And the most popular messaging platform in the world actually owns no telecom infrastructure. If someone talked to you about these examples 10 or 20 years ago, you would have laughed that there are companies without physical assets, without physical infrastructure, being able to scale up so quickly over the last decade or, or so. And that is the kind of potential and excitement that, you know, that I am feeling forward. But in spite of this 
you know, turbulence, this change, the new kind of models that are emerging, the one challenge which still remains across every single company that you talk to is how do you achieve sustainable growth? So this is a database of about 4,000 companies uh, put together by my, uh, my friends at uh, Bain & Company. And what they've done is they've tried to figure out which companies have managed to grow, say, 2x GDP growth rate, have earned profits 2x GDP, and earned the cost of capital. So it's a fairly uh, easy criteria. We're not talking about companies growing at 30, 40, 50%. But even for companies to be able to grow sustainably over 8, 10, eight, ten years, at 10, 12, 13%, both revenue growth, profit growth, and earning the cost of capital, only one in six companies managed to do it. So the track record for companies to be able to drive sustainable, profitable growth is extremely challenging. And when you talk to most of these companies, a lot of them will actually say it is less about the market opportunity. Most of those challenges tend to be fairly internal in nature, not moving fast enough, not being able to decide very quickly, uh, not being able to marshal the resources together. But as you reflect upon the future of the industry, I think think about the role you can play in enabling companies to drive the growth agenda. The single most pro biggest problem will always be, am I growing fast enough? How do I grow? What bets do I need to take? What decisions will allow me to be able to take those bets? But the single, we all get caught up in inflation and job cuts and layoffs and cost reduction. But ultimately, the single most important value driver for a company will be about sustainable, profitable growth. And the more all of you can line yourselves with the growth agenda of the companies, that's where true value will get created over a sustainably long period of time. The challenge again, as we say it is, is twofold. Every single company wants to get operationally efficient. They want to control costs. Uh, they want to move faster. It's all about building a cheaper, faster, better horse. But at the same time, you have to reimagine and imagine the car, right? And to me, that is the biggest challenge. It's an and here. Be operationally efficient to be able to survive in the short term. But the longer term value creation will happen through innovation. It is all being able to imagine, imagine the car. So as you look at your roles also, Think about how you can get faster, cheaper in the kind of services you provide, but help companies innovate, help companies really imagine the car, because that's where true innovation will, will happen. And then there are three big rules of the game that I think every company has to grapple with. In the old world, uh, when you go back to Michael Porter's theories on strategy, the mantra used to be that you can either be low cost or you can be differentiated. The reality is in today's world, you have to do both. You have to find a way to be low cost. You have to find a way to be differentiated. You have to find a way to grow bigger. You have to find a way to get the advantages of scale. But yet you have to figure out how to be closer to the customer. How do you drive speed? How do you drive agility? You have to deliver for today, you have to develop for tomorrow. So I think the world is becoming increasingly of ants. And whenever my team asks me, you know, what's more important, profit or sales? I say congratulations, it's both. The ant world is very important, low cost and differentiation, scale and agility, deliver and develop. And I think companies that can figure this and out across these things, other ones will, which will continue to win in the, in the future. What this means for all of you uh, as an industry is that all of you know very well that consumer journeys are no longer linear. They're getting extremely complicated. There is a huge abundance of data. 
And sometimes we get paralyzed by the amount of information that's available. 20, 30 years ago, finding data used to be the problem. Today, the problem is how do you really make sense of the huge amount of data that's available? Manish talked about technology. A few years ago, a lot of focus was on big data, cloud computing, automation. Today, a lot of discussions are happening about video, mobile tech, and from big data, it's about micro data, and also a little bit about uh, AI and MI. And over the next few years, there will be a lot more discussions around uh, natural language processing. Uh, there'll be lots more discussions around AR and VR. Technology will keep on changing. Uh, that is a fact of life. How you harness the technology, how do you use technology for problem solving, how do you use technology to be able to deliver quicker, probably cheaper or less, uh, uh, will be, become more important. And so I think embrace technology, but don't get too worried about technology. It will keep on changing. It has changed over the last 10, 20 years. All of you have adapted quite well. You will continue to learn how to adapt in the future. And whether we like it or not, time frames will get shorter. There will always be budget pressures. Those will be common complaints all of you face. It is part of life. Learn to deal with it. Use technology. Get more efficient. Get closer to the customer. Understand the needs to be far more responsive and become a more value-added partner for them. What's also quite interesting is that, you know, at least we are seeing a lot of very interesting business models emerge in the insights industry. Those of you who are in the thick and thin of things will have a much more richer perspective on these, whether it's subscription-based models, whether it's pay-as-you-go, whether it is DIY research platforms, whether it could be performance-linked models. And we're also seeing India becoming a global hub. All of these will create new players. It will actually create new opportunities. And so my suggestion is understand the economics of these models. Don't resist it. Try and figure out you know, which of these models was actually stake. But keep on understanding what your consumer needs are and your customer needs are. And then figure out which of these models you can use to build a much more thriving practice in a business going, uh, going forward. A couple of things for you to be careful about. I think this is data uh, which is not from India, which is across about eight other different markets of the world, uh, done by GRBN, I think, uh, uh, this year, earlier on this year. But when you ask consumers about how much they trust market research companies to protect and appropriately use personal data, only 21% of the consumers say they trust market research companies. 33% don't trust, 40% don't know. So I think being able to have very strong codes of conduct in your organizations that you enforce in both letter and spirit, respect data, at the end of the data, at the end of the day, while it might be data for you, it's actually an individual behind the data. So how do you evolve your thinking, your approaches, to be able to really think through how to protect data, how will you handle zero-party data? I think those are very important things for the industry to start grappling with. Probably it is not impacting India that much today, but over the next five or two, 10 years, protection of data, uh, making consumers and customers feel like you're protecting the data is very important, and this, uh, this you know, study should be somewhat sobering uh, to all of us in the room about the need to actually step up our game as far as protection of data is, is concerned. But at the end of the day, and I was talking to Sandeep and Sorin before the, the discussion, and they were asking, so what do you feel about the industry? See, at the end of the day, as the business world is getting more complex, as there is a much higher need to make quicker decisions, as customers and consumers and companies are confronted with a huge amount of choices, there is a tremendous opportunity, but choices creates complexity as well. And companies and organizations need a hand to guide them to be able to make 
far better evidence-based decision making. Ultimately, I think companies which can make faster, uh, better, and higher velocity decisions will be the ones to be able to win in the future. Your roles as being able to provide the insights and having a stronger seat at the table to be able to really guide and enable decision making will get much more important in the future. For you, I think, the more complex the world becomes, the greater the amount of choices that companies are grappling with, the more value-added your role will become. So as I look at the future of the industry, while there will be challenges about budgets, while there will be challenges about uh, timelines, while there will be technological changes, the role of the industry to guide evidence decision-making will actually get more and more important in the future. So you guys are sitting in a very good place right now. As Manish said, what got you here will not get you there, but certainly in terms of the prospects of the industry, the kind of opportunities that I see, honestly, the sky is the limit. What you have to remember, though, is that the industry always loves to do what I call big strategic engagements. No one loves it better than a four or five month rich strategy project. Those are very important. But think about the role companies play. Every company, while they take three or four major decisions every year, but every company will make hundreds of small, no regret moves or small decisions. Think about your role in terms of being able to actually be a very value-added partner in those small tactical decisions. Whether it's a new ad, or fixing a customer experience problem, or an incremental feature, a lot of the dollars and money will actually get start shifting towards those more daily tactical decisions. So reorient the approach. Definitely go for the big strategic projects, but actually just think about also where the money will be spent and reorient your approach to be far more focused on actually enabling companies to make better tactical decisions. Because without those tactical decisions, every strategy will become useless. So think about the approach that you will change uh, accordingly. And I think Manish touched about this, and this is one of my favorite topics, is think about your role in terms of being great storytellers. Simplify those 200 slide dense presentations. Bring it down to a few critical points. Change your communication approach. Spend far more time on the executive summary rather than the 100 page deck. Because guess what? Most of your clients will not go beyond slide three of your deck. Try and put Word documents in place as opposed to hiding behind PowerPoint. Uh, think about how you will change your communication styles to be better storytellers. And I'll show you two videos. The first video is one of my favorites. I think almost all of you are familiar with Hans Rosling, who was a brilliant expert, an academician, who was a, a brilliant data visualization person. This video, I think, was shot about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. Some of you may have seen it, but you know, I've seen it about 50 or 60 times. Each time I see it, I'm just amazed as to how he uses one slide from a visualization perspective and tells a very powerful story. And watch Hans as to how he sets up the slide. Watch Hans in terms of how he communicates the message. See how animated he is to be able to tell this story from just one, one piece of analysis. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. 
So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy. From 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person. 400, 4,000 and 40,000 dollars. So, down here is poor and sick. And up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou, it is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? You know, just uh, when you get a chance, if you haven't seen this, go by and watch it frame by frame, you know, because every frame actually has some incredible insights in terms of the humor he's using, the setup, and literally, as he said, you know, 200 countries over 200 years, 125,000 data points being communicated so powerfully to be able to capture uh, what are some very rich uh, insights in a very, very visual, engaging, uh, engaging, uh, engaging manner. And I'll leave you with, uh, I think, one of my other favorite examples, and this comes from, you know, Google. Um, and 
some of you may have already seen uh, this, uh, this commercial about the year in search from last year, where every year Google assembles together all the data from the billions of searches that they do to put together a story. And just see within a minute, minute and a half, you know, what Google manages to do, taking all their billions of search data to really summarize what the big themes of, of last year were. This year has been extremely challenging for me. I am broken. And I am healing. I'm here at the memorial wall. I wanted to do something to remember my mom. For some reason, I'm having anxiety. Obviously, it's normal with everything that's going on right now. I think I'm going to take a break for a while. You can get through it, and if you can get through it, there's a greater reward on the other side. Just like anybody else, you know, I'm just trying to do my little part to try and save my community. Ta-da! I'm just really excited we're back open. And I am smiling under my mask. Incredible scenes on the day the fans came back. Welcome back to the theater. You guys, it's been so long. You're looking at yourself in the mirror, and you're just like, there I am. Be your best. Never, ever, ever stop dreaming. I don't care what they tell you. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, find the defendant guilty. I am proud to be agent. We are not drowning. We are fighting. We cannot keep quiet about climate injustice. No action is too small. We just have to band together as a community and get people's lives back. Even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you for all the amazing partnership and support that you provide to all kinds of organizations, big and small, uh, to enable us to make better quality uh, decisions. I think all of you should feel very proud of the rich history uh, that, uh, that you have a responsibility to build on. Uh, as I mentioned, the future looks very bright. Certainly, there are things that you will have to change and adapt. But do take the next couple of days to reflect and celebrate on how far this uh, industry has come along, and also talk about the future ahead, and what all of you can do to be able to unleash your individual and collective potential. Thank you very much.